This is Sammy Morris, head of the Purdue Libraries Archives and Special Collections. Today I'm interviewing Charles Watkinson, director of the Purdue University Press and head of scholarly publishing services at Purdue University. This is part of the library's oral history program. The date is June 19th, 2014. Charles, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Sammy. I'm going to start off with some short and basic questions that identify you for the record. Could you please state your full name and when and where you were born? Yes, my name is Charles Watkinson and I was born in Oxford, England, uh, May 10th, 1972. Great. And could you just tell me a little bit about your early education um, up through maybe college years and majors? Mm -hmm. So I was uh, um, educated in England. Um, I uh, started focusing in on humanities and social sciences areas at high school and then I did archaeology and anthropology at Pembroke College, Cambridge and uh, graduated there in 1993. Uh, so that was, uh, uh, I also did an MBA in 2005 um, at Oxford Brookes University. Oh, that is an interesting mix of, of subject areas. What made you transition to the MBA? Well, by that stage, I'd been uh, working uh, in a small company context for several years and felt the need of uh, some more formal business education, oh. having come out of very much an academic background. Sure. Okay. Well, um, I know that you've held other positions prior to coming to Purdue. Could you just quickly cover those for us in terms of your path from college years to here? So as a graduate in archaeology, I was unemployable. <laughs> so uh, I found employment eventually in a specialist bookseller in archaeology, classics, and medieval studies called Oxbo Books, O-X-B-O-W, Oxbo oh. Books. Um, which was a small company starting off in Oxford. Um, it was run by um, a curator in Anglo-Saxon studies at the Ashmolean Museum in his part time. And its mission was to provide books in this very specialist area uh, to libraries and individuals. Huh. And it grew quite rapidly. I start, when I started, I was employee number four. And that was in 1994. And when I left in uh, uh, 2004, I was employee number 40. Nice. So it had really grown over the years. So I worked at Oxbow Books um, from 1994 to 1999. And then I moved to uh, grow uh, its US operation, which had just opened up in um, Oakville, Connecticut, just outside Waterbury. Um, and by that stage, Oxbow had three roles. It was a publisher of archaeology, classical, and medieval studies. It was a distributor of books on behalf of European presses mainly, but also some American learned societies. And it was a bookseller um, selling works from all publishers, um, including some fairly obscure European publishers to um, libraries and individuals. Hmm. So. Um, our, um, my role as general manager of the U.S. office uh, was to grow our activities in the U.S. market in those three areas. That's so, yeah, in 2004, um, I was hired by one of our American distributed clients, so the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, mm. as their director of publications. And that was partly because of my professional experience, but it was also um, because uh, I had been very involved in archaeology in the Mediterranean all through my period at Oxbow. And um, so, uh, you know, I was, already, I was a, a sort of a practicing archaeologist still, so I combined those two skills. And so 2004 to 2009, I was director of publications at the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, but my base was in Princeton, New Jersey. Oh. And 2009 was when I started here. And what was it like transitioning into the academic environment in terms of your, your job at that time at Athens, or New Jersey, rather? So transitioning from being kind of a learned society publisher in archaeology to being a publisher at a university, mm -hmm. in a university context, 
I mean, it was really like drinking from the fire hose oh. because you move from being focused on one subject area to having a limitless collection of disciplines in which you can publish. Oh. So that was the biggest challenge um, opportunity that I found was, um, you know, where do you focus your publishing activity I in see. a comprehensive university? And how did you do that? Um, slowly. <laughs> um, <laughs> but one of the central focuses of my work has been on the idea of alignment. So mm -hmm. um, how can you take a university press, and at this stage it was really just the university press, and how can you um, align that university press with the university parent? Mm. And that's a particular challenge at a university like Purdue, because university presses are generally associated with the humanities and social sciences, mm -hmm. but Purdue's strengths and focus is clearly on STEM areas or STEAM areas, including agriculture. Right. So really my main goal over the last few years, uh, almost five years, has been to find ways of connecting to areas outside the humanities and social sciences while still being loyal to the founding intent of Purdue University Press, which was as uh, you know, a foundation of the College of Liberal Arts to continue to support humanists and social scientists. Yeah, that would be a challenge. So I guess that's a good transition into you joining the Purdue Press in 2009. Um, could you tell me what some of your first impressions were of the press and, and maybe some initial thoughts you had on, on your vision and how you might change or improve it? So uh, in 2008, just before I was hired, a very important change happened at Purdue University Press, which was that it was physically moved from South Campus Courts um, so the outskirts of campus, into Stewart Center, into the heart of library's administration. So my office that I moved into was just above the dean's office. And that was a very important physical move because it moved into much nicer space. Um, the technology was much better, um, and it was just a much more pleasant environment than South Campus Courts. But it was also a really important social and symbolic move because from being peripheral to campus, the press was being moved by the Dean of Libraries to be central to campus and also um, centrally located within the libraries in a place where press staff could start to really collaborate and uh, integrate with their library colleagues. Right. Because that reporting relationship had been in place since the 1990s, uh, the reporting from the university press director to the Dean of Libraries. But the integration really started in 2008 with that move. So my first impressions were very positive. I, I had been to South Campus Courts as an interviewee, but seeing the new space was very exciting. Um, I also found some challenges. Uh, the press had gone through a financial, uh, some financially challenging years, and the um, interim director, Brian Schaefer, had done a fantastic job in finding ways to get the press back into the black mm -hmm. with support from the provost office mediated through Dean Mullins. Mm -hmm. So, but there was still this kind of, this feeling of um, uh, slight, slightly low morale um, and also um, a lot of questioning uh, about how to make the press not be a financial burden mm -hmm. going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and also there was, um, the staff were extremely good, but their job descriptions were slightly blurry. They had titles which didn't necessarily describe what they were doing. Oh, I see. So those are my first impressions. Um, very, very soon I came to realize um, the unique position of being part of a library in a real way rather than just reporting when I started to be involved in Dean's Council meetings mm -hmm. um, and uh, started to understand and really get to know senior colleagues, including yourself, Sammy. Well, I'm curious about um, how that compared to your previous position in the American School of Classical Studies. Was there a relationship there with the library and the press? Yes. I think, uh, I mean, I think that's partly why I got the job here. Um, I had been the co-PI on a Mellon Foundation grant 
which was looking at the organization of information at the American School of Classical Studies. Mm -hmm. And the other co-PI was the head of the libraries, or the head of the Blagan Library there, the biggest library there, um, Chuck Jones, who's mm -hmm. now at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, sorry, Penn State. Um, and Chuck and I were collaborating on a project where we were looking at the way in which this single institution, the American School of Classical Studies, performed all the functions of a university mm. in a small context. So it has, the American School has two excavation projects, the Athenian Agora and ancient Corinth, which have been going for you know, 50 to 100 years. And those are producing research um, outputs. They're, they are doing excavations all the time. They're producing information. Um, that information, much of it is then moved into the archives. So the American School has a strong archives, and the excavations themselves have archives. And then the information is being, uh, the, the data extracted is being studied by scholars who are working in the libraries and using library resources to place these discoveries in context. Oh, uh -huh. And then their work is being published by the publications office uh, and the work of the publications office is then being reintegrated into the libraries mm -hmm. and into the excavations. So it's informing what's going to happen in the future at those excavations. So, um, and in the background, there's an IT infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So it was really interesting to see how the libraries and publications office working together could form, um, it could create infrastructure and s sort of workflows to really improve the movement of that information around the system. Yeah, um, creation of new knowledge, it sounds like. Right? Creation of new knowledge, and especially in the context of uh, digital, yeah. with archaeology posing some very big digital challenges, mm. um, both um, in terms of the um, quantity of data produced, because um, you have an awful lot of uh, photographic data, you have GIS models, um, as well as just um, uh, you know, all, all the sort of the records that are kept um, with the idea that when you excavate, you destroy. So the only record of the context remaining is a written record. Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect of archaeological data. There's an awful lot of it. But the other aspect that really challenged us in that project was that it's very difficult to organize archaeological data because there is no set ontology. Oh. There's, uh, there's, there are no good systems of metadata for organizing it. Um, and different archaeological excavations use completely different systems. Mm -hmm. So one of our real focuses was trying to map all of this stuff together into a single system. Oh, that would be a challenge. And we didn't succeed. Oh. But I learned a lot. Well, it's still, that's still a challenge a lot of places are facing now, I think. So mm -hmm. that's, that's interesting. Okay. Well, um, I guess I should have probably backed up a bit when we talked about your transition to Purdue, about what it was that attracted you or interested you in the position here. Well, I didn't know anything about Purdue mm -hmm. when the job became available. Um, and initially, I have to confess that it was personal reasons that made me interested. Mm -hmm. um, my wife uh, I was working at University of Louisville. We had met on an archaeological excavation in Albania, in fact. But she, is, uh, she was at the University of Louisville. And before we got married, I was clearly looking for a way to move to the Midwest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, Purdue is only three hours away. And um, that was a wonderful part of this position. But as soon as I came for, well, started to research uh, the situation and also um, came to visit, um, it became clear that there were some exciting things going on. And the opportunity to build on that relationship between press and libraries was very interesting. And <clears throat> back in 2009, the implications of a very important report were only just being felt. And this was the um, Ithaca report on the university as a publisher in oh, the digital yes. age. Uh -huh. And many of the recommendations of the Ithaca report about leveraging the capacity of a university to publish and thinking beyond the university press, many of those obviously were starting to feed into Purdue and into the dean's vision. Mm -hmm. So that was very exciting. 
Would, was there any involvement in prior positions you had? I, I assume it would mostly be at, at the position at Athens with an institutional repository or something like that? Mm -hmm. So that was not unusual that here it was something you're familiar with. Yeah. One of the um, focuses of the work that the Mellon Foundation was supporting <coughs> was to create an institutional repository. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and we had a consultant called Thorny Staples, mm -hmm. who is now at the Smithsonian Institution, who helped design a prototype Fedora repository. Oh, uh huh. It didn't get implemented. Well, it sounds like you had challenging formats and metadata and, and many other things. But I would think that experience of planning would have been helpful here in terms of seeing what we had here. Absolutely. Um, Excuse me, I cough. Yeah, go ahead. <coughs> okay, thanks, Charles. Um, we just had a momentary break for water, and um, you were talking a little bit about when you came to Purdue, what some of your initial ideas and, and vision were. If you could just expand on that a little bit. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I talked about the alignment of editorial focus um, and the attempt to go beyond humanities and social sciences. But um, a second thing that I was very interested in was um, collaboration. And this was not only about exploring what being part of a library is meant for a university press, but it was also about forming connections around campus. Mm -hmm. Because one of the central issues with university presses have been the way in which they have been marginal to their parent institutions. So really looking at um, ways in which we could have touch points with lots and lots of different entities, departments, individuals on campus mm -hmm. was a second part of what I was intending to do. And then the third area was around digital scholarship and um, being part of a library is one of the major um, opportunities that offers is the opportunity to be more experimental because one's in a community of colleagues who are experienced in digital scholarship mm -hmm. and also one has access to infrastructure like the repositories to really explore that. So that was really the third thing, exploring um, the opportunity to explore um, what digital publishing could look like and the potential um, that was lay in these new technologies. Oh, that's great. Well, I was curious, um, something you talked about a little bit before you came was um, the move, of course, to from campus, South Campus Courts. Where did that fall? You said when you interviewed, you were at South Campus Courts. Did that ever play into any negotiations you were having for the position that the press have a more prominent space on campus? Or was that already in the works when you were? No, it was already in the works. This mm -hmm. was entirely um, Jim Mullins's vision at that stage um, and um, it just happened That's and great. by the time I arrived Brian had done terrific work in making it happen. Okay so this is Brian Schaefer. Yes. Who, um, his position then is it was it like the associate director of the press or what? I, He's never had that title. Okay. Uh, he is de, de facto that person. I see. Um, he is now called sales and marketing manager. Okay. At the time I think he was called production and design manager. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, at some point around 2012, I believe, is whenever our scholarly publishing services started as a unit in the libraries, according to the research I was able to dig up. Um, I know that the, there was a lot of discussion about how the press would be a good fit for this, but also not the perfect fit in terms of things like um, brand and where publishing services might veer from the traditional press um, I guess, activity. So I was wondering if you could tell me, as the, the first head of that unit and really being instrumental in getting it started, how it came about and, and why did you feel the need or the, the justification for having it associated sort of through your position but in different ways? So um, my three goals had been alignment, collaboration, and digital innovation. Um, and as we explored those goals from 2009 to 2012, so we being you know, the staff of the press, um, and also particularly with some colleagues, some crucial colleagues, uh, Mark Newton, oh, yes. um, who was uh, uh, the digital repository manager uh, at that time. Um, as we explored those goals, 
it became apparent that some of the traditions of university press presses were limiting us. Um, so around about, um, you know, this whole mission to really kind of become more aligned with campus, uh, to collaborate more with um, people on campus who had real publishing needs. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it's a real problem for university presses to do that kind of activity because um, they have a tradition of not publishing the work of their own faculty. They also have a tradition of only publishing peer-reviewed materials, mm -hmm. um, and they're strongly associated with books and the physical artifact. And so all of those aspects actually made being a university press kind of, it was kind of shackles for us. Mm -hmm. It actually limited the ability of us to serve the needs on campus. So scholarly publishing services, the creation of that was a way of being able to publish outside the press imprint, not having to necessarily go through the editorial board, not, own, not having to just do um, peer-reviewed scholarship, um, and not just being a books publisher. Even though we had three subscription-based journals, it was still very, very associated with books. So that was really the motivating thing. And by that stage, by 2012, we had several important relationships that weren't neatly fitting within the university press imprint. Mm -hmm. um, the first of those was with JTRP, the Joint Transportation Research Program, right. where Mark had uh, initiated conversations um, working with um, you, Sammy, and with Paul Brackey, um, Associate Dean for IT, or what, so, so at that stage, yeah. IT. Um, so had initiated uh, uh, collaborations around technical reports. Um, where there was a need at that stage for help in the production of technical reports going forwards where the press staff were becoming involved. So that was one relationship. Another one was uh, the Journal of Purdue Undergraduate Research um, and uh, that had been a project uh, that had been brought to Mark and myself by a professor in Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences called Greg Mikowski and we had got funding from the provost's office in 2010 to um, start this undergraduate research journal. Um, and another project had been um, a conversation with Alan Beck in the vet school uh, around the creation of a repository for the scholarship of the human-animal bond. So that had resulted in a grant um, for the creation of this site, Habri Central. So all three things were fitting awkwardly under the umbrella, as it were, of the press. Mm -hmm. And scholarly publishing services provided a way of uh, giving them some kind of, um, some kind of uh, you know, unification, um, unitary presence. That makes sense, yeah. That was actually gonna be my next question, was what were some of the things that you wanted to do? So that's, that's perfect. Um, well, there have been so many changes and innovations during your tenure with the press, and I'm curious how you would describe its evolution, I guess, over the last five years or so that you've been here. Well, I think many of the changes have come from the external environment, and those changes are observable across the libraries, um, you know, in archives, um, uh, in uh, the library's activities uh, connected to learning and involvement and impact in new spaces, etc. So the press changes have really been a product of the changing environment. Um, but, uh, you know, the underlying um, goals of the alignment, the collaboration, the digital and innovation have driven everything. Mm -hmm. And they have been reinforced constantly because of the fact that we have uh, Jim, Jim Mullins set up the uh, management advisory board for the press very oh. early on. Uh -huh. uh, and that was a new thing. I was the first um, person to have the benefit of this advice from a management advisory board. But Which every six months they have been a check-in point for these strategic goals. 
Sorry. Do you recall approximately when that was established? Mm -hmm. uh, the first meeting was in um, October 2009. No, it was in spring 2010. Spring so, so not too long after you started no. at Purdue. That is, that is interesting. I had not realized it was that new. Mm -hmm. um, well, you've, you've spoken about some pretty significant things just kind of quickly going over. Um, the tremendous collaboration with JTRP, which has obviously just grown and been so successful, founding of JPure uh, Journal for Undergraduate Research, and also creation of Havre Central. Um, each of these is, is kind of worthy of an interview amongst themselves, but is there any more you'd like to say about you know, what has been involved in those initiatives or any, any thoughts you have on where they might be going in the near future? I think each one of them is rather different. <clears throat> JTRP um, exemplifies how important it is to have good collaborators and people who are naturally collaborative. So the um, experience with JTRP, uh, the, the reason it's been so positive has definitely been the driving force of Darcy Bullock, the head of uh, JTRP, and Debbie Horton, his managing director, because they've just always been good collaborators mm -hmm. and they've always understood the big picture. Um, JTRP is um, good because it also fits into a number of uh, libraries related um, missions um, and one of the most important for me is the way in which it's making grey literature discoverable. Absolutely. Um, JPure has been a beneficiary of the university's focus on um, the student learning experience and the increased emphasis on experiential learning as being a major benefit of being a student at a physical research university. So the growth of undergraduate research um, has been um, a university priority um, and JPure has played a role in bringing it to prominence but has been a beneficiary of the provost's office um, focus on that. So JPure has been, um, uh, to me, very successful in the area of bringing some of the library's strategic goals um, into the area of publishing. Um, so for JPure, the process has become even more important than the product. Mm. So the involvement of library faculty members like Catherine Reilly and Megan Sapp Nelson and Sharon Weiner mm -hmm. in um, the training of the student authors for JPure is really at the heart of it, um, and also in the assessment of student success coming out of JPure. So scholarly communication messages and information literacy uh, skills are all fed to the students who become JPR authors. Um, and those authors are really incentivized to understand what it means to be an academic author yes. and uh, you know, retain one's rights and um, publish in an ethical way. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really exciting about JPR. Habri Central is a problem. Um, Habri Central is one of um, this whole group of sort of virtual community experiments, um, modern day portals that seem to be more and more common. Um, you know, it, it's something different from the portals in the 1990s. But it's this idea that you have a community, maybe a diverse community, and they need to have some central gathering place, a hub. Mm -hmm. But it's been a problem because. Um, uh, really getting that community engaged in yet another digital project has been hard because I think their attention is so thinly spread between you know commercial social media outlets you know um, mm -hmm. Facebook etc and um, then other academic projects and um, it's very hard to get that community to really work properly so all very different challenges uh, different opportunities um, I'm very optimistic about the JTRP collaboration. I'm very optimistic about JPure. Um, I hope Habri Central will power through. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, this, is, this has been a theme throughout your career, certainly, is, is scholarly communication. And with the changes happening so rapidly, just driven by technology and resources and so many other factors, um, I'm curious about 
you know, what, how do you see for the future of university presses going forward? It, how critical is it that they work with, with libraries or within libraries? Or um, I know this ties in also with the grant that you received from IMLS where you were exploring libraries publishing services. And I'd really would like to hear about sort of what you see as, as being at this critical junction, the most important things that presses and libraries should be focusing on. So I, um, I view Purdue, Purdue now, the Purdue Publishing Presence, the Libraries Publishing Division, <coughs> as occupying two worlds of publishing. As a, it's a university press, and it's a member of the Association of American University Presses, mm -hmm. but it's also a library publisher, and it's an initiating member of the Library Publishing Coalition mm -hmm. that becomes official actually this July. So it's important to see it with those two hats on, those two... Mm -hmm. two equal parts now. Um, but there is an important, um, I mean, there's an important message for university presses in what's happened at Purdue. 27% um, of university presses that refer, that are within universities refer to themselves as university presses. So um, these are the members of AAUP who have university press in their names. Mm -hmm. 27% of those at this point report to libraries. But there is so much more opportunity for that relationship to become more than a reporting relationship. Mm -hmm. And there are crucial things that have happened at Purdue that have made that, um, made I think Purdue a leader in exploring that level of integration, although there's still a long way to go. And one of those was the physical co-location, so the move to be physically part of the libraries. And the center of campus. Uh, the second one was um, involvement, full involvement in the strategic planning of the libraries back in 2010 for the library strategic plan starting 2011. And the fact that during that process, the dean would always turn to me and Brian Schaefer, who were re representing the, the press there, and say, do you see yourselves in this goal? Mm -hmm. Do you see yourselves in this goal? So that was, those two things, um, <clears throat> So beyond reporting, the physical co-location and the strategic involvement in strategic planning were really crucial to what's been achieved at Purdue. And going forward, it's really important that those presses who report to deans of libraries are also involved in those ways. Um, because university presses um, are still perceived as backwards looking, print focused, um, humani just humanities uh, focused, um, antagonistic towards open access, um, uh, you know, lots of bad things. And many of those perceptions are unfair mm -hmm. because university presses have uh, suffer under a lot of constraints. And it's not only the financial constraint, which is well known, you know, that university presses um, on average receive only 15% of their funding from the university. They actually need to earn all the rest of that through sales. Mm -hmm. So that, of course, alters the way they think about things. But it's also to do with this kind of old model that university presses are only allowed to publish peer-reviewed stuff. Mm -hmm. And they should be particularly focused on humanities books. And tenure committees require a printed product. Mm -hmm. So all of those constraints have made it very difficult for innovation to happen. But even despite that, there has been a lot of um, openness to innovation and very recently I've been involved strongly in um, discussions around open access monographs and what it takes to change the system so that monographic literature can also be open access and I've been struck throughout those conversations how open the university press directors I've been working with are, are, are to those ideas oh, uh -huh. and I think you know people many people from the libraries being in that conference room would have been surprised by the openness. Yeah. So, so what, what kind of, I know that the university presses typically don't publish their own faculty research, or that's not their main focus, um, rightly so, because it could be perceived as, you know, just doing it to help out the local faculty. But in terms of open textbooks, so would you be looking at um, textbooks that would be supporting your institution but written by someone else, or would you be looking at supporting textbooks written by the faculty at your institution for another institution or 
So actually, the conversations have been more focused on open access monographs rather than textbooks. Oh, I see. So it's like, you know, and the definition of monographs has been really tricky, but mm -hmm. it's really, you know, uh, research reports, um, uh, long form, um, often the first product of a new scholar. But you do bring up an interesting point, which is um, open access textbooks has been a, a major area of growth and interest mm -hmm. for university presses, although it's been more in the context of affordable textbooks right. rather right. than entirely open. Mm -hmm. And that's partly because authors themselves don't tend to want open access textbooks because those authors are considering textbooks as a financial in financial terms, a lot sure. of faculty get a lot of money from textbooks, um, and uh, they are tending, therefore, to want, uh, they like affordability, they don't like free. Right, right. Um, but I do think that's an interesting point, that textbooks was not a traditional area for university presses, but by being per university press and scholarly publishing services, we've been able to be much more involved in those kind of discussions mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. projects. Well, and I think the profile of the press has really been raised across campus for precisely the things you've talked about in terms of collaboration across campus and things like that. Um, being centrally located has certainly helped as well. Um, what would you say would be one of your proudest moments of accomplishment during your tenure here? I mean, I think it's, um, you know, it's an easy one. Maybe it's too easy, but uh, partly because it was such an enjoyable project but uh, I do think the Spacewalker collaboration that you and I worked on was really one of the most fun projects. Um, and I'm kind of proud of it because it, it kind of hit those three target areas. Um, first, of the, first, first of all, it's aligned. I mean, Purdue is the cradle of astronauts. Um, it, uh, the, the book publication came uh, just after the Baron Hilton archivist mm -hmm. uh, was appointed. Um, and the strong involvement of the libraries in astronautics uh, was a lovely context for that book. So it's, um, uh, when I arrived at Purdue, it was always, you know, people always said, why doesn't Purdue publish astronauts? Mm -hmm. So it was wonderful that Jerry agreed to publish that book with us, because I think alignment was demonstrated. Um, the collaboration side of it, um, being able to um, have, uh, you know, have the collaboration um, with the archives, was really exciting about that project because that enabled the third part, the digital innovation. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we're able to do the app, but also that we're able to make those connections between the book and the archival collections. And now also to make the connection with the College of Education and mm -hmm. support um, Jerry Ross's ambitions around inspiring the next generation of science, scientists through his story, um, scientists, scientists and engineers. So I loved that project from all those different angles, and it didn't hurt that it sold an, a, a number of copies. I mean, it sold almost, uh, I think, now over 10,000 copies, mm -hmm. which provided the financial means that we need to support more rarefied and niche scholarship, because we still have a strong cost recovery mandate for the press. We have to balance mm -hmm. the, the, we have to cover the costs of our publishing program. Absolutely. So it's, it's been a great project. I agree. I, I think it's really hit on a lot of important things. It's just had a lot of bang for its buck. And one of the things that I've really admired is the way that you have integrated the press into the learning goal of the overall university by things like this and also with um, you and Catherine really teaching a course on publishing. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how that idea for that class came about. So this was a, an honors college class in publishing and it was run in spring 2014. And um, the Honours College uh, has uh, you know, been relatively new at Purdue. It's a relatively new concept. Um, but uh, the approach to do that came from Emily Allen, the Associate Dean of the Honours College. Um, and she was looking for um, good opportunities for students to experience things rather than have somebody just talking at them to really experience things. Mm -hmm. um, and the opportunity that that class offered was for students to create a book. And they were working actually with an honors college class from the previous semester that had worked on 
interdisciplinary approaches to writing and had chosen to focus on archival resources, especially the debris, and that was a course taught by Chris Bross and Neil Harmeyer from the archives. Um, and um, that project had created this content, all these bios of debris students of 1904, which was then taken by the students in the spring semester in the publishing class and was turned into a book through the processes of um, developmental editing, uh, copy editing, design, and finally print production. Mm -hmm. So they experienced and were in charge of all of those uh, under the direction of Catherine Reilly and then Catherine Purple, who is um, another crucial part of the press, uh, uh, presses and scholarly publishing services success. Uh, and she's a managing editor at the press and publishing services. So it was a really interesting project and I see lots of potential for more collaboration for the libraries with the Honours College. Um, and it sort of opened my eyes to the range of opportunities there. It certainly seemed like it was it was building on things that had, had already started and just the impact of it could really be far reaching in terms of providing these students with opportunities to have published work as they as they graduate as undergraduates. That's tremendous, I think. That and Jay Pure as well. But again it was the process, not the product. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's an interesting that's interesting for the libraries and what we're realizing more and more, isn't it? I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's not about our collections, our publications. Mm -hmm. It's more about the support that we can offer, the services we can offer that results in those, yeah. that makes us distinctive. That really does provide students with the learning opportunities they need to succeed. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, I know that we're running short on time, and I did want to quickly talk about uh, your transition as the Associate University Librarian for Publishing and Director of the University of Michigan Press on July 1st. Uh, congratulations on your new position, and Thank I you. wondered, could you tell us a little bit about how you think your position there might compare or contrast with your position here? So, University of Michigan libraries <coughs> have been the grandfather, the grandmother of um, this <clears throat> experiment in university press library integration um, and they have always been the model uh, on which um, presses like Purdue etc have they've always been looked at as the pioneers mm -hmm. so it's really exciting <coughs> to go into the um, to, to, to make that transition um, it's a much bigger operation. Um, I mean, here we're around 10 staff, and Michigan will be 50. Wow, that is a huge change. Um, and that size brings greater challenges, mm -hmm. um, and particular challenges around territoriality and subdivision of responsibilities. Um, so the other thing about University of Michigan Press has been that it's been a famous press for decades. Um, and publishers, uh, poet laureates, um, publishers, prize winners um, in various national awards. So there's a, um, there's a much greater heritage there. Mm -hmm. And um, the culture of the press and the culture of the libraries may be more strongly embedded. Uh, and so, you know, that, that poses um, challenges around operating as a, as a consolidated single entity. So that will be really interesting to work, to work, uh, work through. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Those collaboration skills will certainly come in handy. Um, Watch me crash and burn. <laughs> no, no. I think it's going to be fantastic. And it's, it's obviously um, a, a sign of, of the reputation, I think, that you've built here that you know, they would be seeking you for that position. So congratulations again. And we're going to miss you here, but um, I know you're on to bigger and better things. So. Well, bigger maybe. I mean, um, I think it's also a sign of the um, high esteem in which Purdue Libraries is held mm -hmm. because, um, you know, my colleague Jake Carlson, our colleague, is oh, also yes, moving on. Right. And I mean, Jake and I have talked, and I mean, it's not so much us, but Purdue Libraries that are getting the recognition, I suspect. I suspect maybe it's, it's a, a balance. Combination maybe it's of, a balance. Of many, many things there. But, um, well, is there anything else you'd like to share for the record today? No, um, not really. Um, just thanks to you for the collaborations that we've 
experience together and oh, being part of. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think uh, archival culture is very well defined. Um, university press culture is very well defined. Other libraries culture is very well defined. And so none of those relationships are ever going to be entirely smooth sail sailing, but yeah. it's the goodwill, ultimate goodwill and desire to make these things succeed that makes a difference. And uh, good collaborators who just are always thinking out for the, you know, looking for the bigger picture yeah. are the secret to it all. So I really appreciated that well, uh, in working with you. It's been a joy for us as well. So thank you so much. And thank you. Best wishes. Thank you. Thank you.